From London, this is The Standard Podcast, and I'm Mark Blunden. Coming up... TfL said, oh, it's a fuss about nothing, storm in a teacup. Don't believe everything you see in uh, strange documents. But lo and behold, it has come to pass that exactly as expected, it will be £4 to use these two tunnels. Tunnel vision. How much would you pay to cross the Thames? But first... The Sakir Starmer jets to Washington for NATO's 75th anniversary and a meeting with President Joe Biden. His armed forces minister says the government will aim to complete a defence review in less than a year. It comes amid warnings from former military chiefs that Britain is unprepared for the threat of war. Now Minister Luke Pollard said the new government would work at pace to finish the assessment which the Prime Minister said needs to happen before decisions are made on raising defence spending to 2.5% of GDP. It's currently 2.3% and follows billions of pounds in cuts to the military since 2010 as Britain lost one-tenth of its army regiments. To discover more, we're joined by Evening Standard political editor Nicholas Cecil. Nick, what are defence chiefs calling for? Well, defence chiefs uh, are very good at putting pressure on the government to boost defence spending. But in this case, they actually have got a case. So often before budgets and so on, autumn statements, big fiscal events, they're, they're, they're very good at about warning the, of the dangers to Britain and how more needs to be spent on our military. But it's clear with the Putin's war in Ukraine, the growing threat from China, Iran's behaviour, that there's an accepted wisdom that actually defence spending needs to be increased, certainly to 2.5%, if not more. We had um, a very stark warning from the former head of the British Army, General Sir Patrick Sanders. He was saying that uh, the world faces, in his words, as dangerous a moment as at any time that we've had since 1945. And particularly if you look at China, Russia and Iran, he says that they are, again in his words, more interdependent and more aligned than the original Axis powers were. So this is a a very, very clear and loud warning from the defence chiefs. What sort of a state did the Conservatives leave the British military in? This is the key question. Certainly, if you look at the broader public finances, so they are in an absolute dire state. The government had to spend hundreds of billions of pounds to deal with the COVID pandemic, and then another huge sum to deal with the cost of living crisis as energy bills soared due to Putin's war in Ukraine. So essentially, there's very little money to go around. Now, Rishi Sunak, uh, during the election campaign, he pledged to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP by 2030. Sir Keir Starmer has not matched that pledge. So he said a Labour government will increase defence spending to 2.5%, but he hasn't set a date. And that that is crucial because you can make as many pledges as you want. Unless you set a clear timeline, they are effectively meaningless. Sir Keir is making clear that this is a, a very firm commitment. And um, and I s- there would be an expectation that this will happen. But they're also saying that this is all dependent on the public finances. And Labour are, are banking on getting economic growth increasing at a better rate than it has recently to fund uh, extra spending on public services, including defence. So the big question is, can Labour get this extra economic growth for Britain. And one thing that may be in their favour is that we've had so much economic and political turmoil during the Boris Johnson and Liz Truss administrations that some stability now for the next few years is likely to encourage more investors to put their money into Britain because they can actually see that they're more likely to get a decent return than if there's a very volatile situation. So that may favour Labour, but the world is a very unpredictable place at the moment and uh, another crisis could easily knock Labour's plans off course. What do we know about Sakir's defence outlook? Hawk or Dove? Well, I suspect... um, Sakir and Labour's position on defence will be very similar to Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives, that um, the accusation levelled against Labour is that it is or will be soft on defence. And that's partly due to the legacy of the Jeremy Corbyn era, where his commitment to the nuclear deterrent was very doubtful. So I very much suspect that Keir will adopt a very similar strategy to the previous Conservative governments over Ukraine, for example. And uh, everyone, I think, in British politics, or or certainly most people in British politics, recognise that defence spending has to increase in an increasingly volatile world. What's the significance of his first prime ministerial trip to meet Joe Biden? 
This is a key moment, uh, which is always used to show the strength of the special relationship between America and Britain. And this can go through some some wobbles at time. Um, Joe Biden didn't always see eye to eye with, for example, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss's administration over Brexit and issues like that. But it runs far deeper than that. So the special relationship is intergovernmental as well as between individuals and political parties. So Keir Starmer and Mr. Biden, they will discuss the key issues of the day, the Ukraine war, China, the economic situation facing the world. But there's a, a bigger question hanging over the US president, and that is about whether he is fit enough to serve a second term in office. And this question has been dogging him for a while. It got put on um, absolute uh, rocket boosters by his faltering performance during the TV debate against Donald Trump. Now, there is a press conference due to be held at the end of the NATO summit in Washington. And there, everyone will be looking to see how Mr. Biden handles the questions and whether he's very alert and whether people think actually at the age of 81, he can continue for another term in office or whether it's time to pass the baton to someone else. And then the NATO 75th anniversary summit? This is a chance for the West, uh, for NATO countries, to send a, a very firm message to Vladimir Putin that uh, they are into supporting Ukraine uh, for the long term. Because not only does the amount of military support and economic support being given to Kyiv make a huge difference, so that needs to be done. But there's also the diplomatic and the messaging that is crucial. Because Vladimir Putin is banking on the West eventually tarring with this this conflict and putting pressure on Ukraine to yield territory because they they no longer have the support from the West that they currently have. So the NATO leaders will, will try and send a very strong message that there's no intent on on giving up support to Kyiv. And that then throws the pressure back onto the Russian president. But he seems very determined just to, for this very, very bloody war, costing tens of thousands of lives, if not hundreds of thousands, to drag on and on. Let's go to the ads coming up. Going underground in a vehicle. Why you'll have to pay for it now at two London crossings. Our transport editor, Ross Lydell, has the story. Why not hit follow on this podcast in the meantime to give us a rating. Welcome back. Now, last year, our transport editor, Ross Lydell, discovered some road signs for two Thames crossings, the Blackwall Tunnel and under construction Silvertown Tunnel. And these showed that there's soon to be tolls to pay. Now, Transport for London has confirmed fees of up to £4 per journey during peak hours, but it's still free from 10pm to 6am. And from City Hall, Ross joins us now. Last year, you discovered a bit of early information about those fees in the TfL documents. Now, it's been confirmed. What are you reporting on Wednesday? The latest news, Mark, is that Transport for London is to impose a £4 peak toll on car drivers using both the Blackwall Tunnel and the new Silvertown Tunnel, as we uh, initially thought uh, late last year. As you say, uh, around sort of autumn time last year, some pictures of road signs or draft road signs emerged when Transport for London was trying to get permission from the government to impose these tolls. Uh, at the time, TfL said, oh, it's a fuss about nothing, storm in a teacup, don't believe everything you see in uh, strange documents. But lo and behold, it has come to pass that exactly as expected, it will be £4 to use these two tunnels. Uh, although not all time, what's come out today is also the sort of finessing of the details. So the £4 charge will only apply at peak times. It's all a little bit complicated but bear with me Uh, so if you're driving northbound between 6am and 10am on weekdays you'll pay £4 and if you're driving south between 4pm and 7pm on weekdays you'll pay £4 at other times you will pay £1.50 however the other times only includes between 6am and 10pm because both tunnels will be free from 10pm to 6am so essentially the tunnels will be free to use overnight but there will be fees to pay 
if you like, during daylight hours in general. The one caveat to all that is that you only get to pay £1.50 if you register your vehicle in advance with TfL. What will the toll money raised go towards? The money raised will go straight back down the tunnel. It will go right down uh, the Silvertown Tunnel because the Silvertown Tunnel, which is uh, popping out not far from where I speak to you right now, it's just to the west of the new City Hall in the Royal Docks. That has cost about a billion pounds to dig and it's been done under a PFI scheme. Now, these PFI schemes were beloved of Tony Blair back Back in the day when he was Prime Minister, he used many PFI schemes to uh, build hospitals and also actually to modernise the tube back in the early 2000s. PFI scheme was chosen by TfL to construct the Silvertown Tunnel because it didn't want to divert its sort of ready supply of cash into the tunnel rather than spending on a day-to-day basis on the tube. But what that means is that the one, £1 billion pound cost of constructing the tunnel, once you've added all the interest charges on, the total comes to about £2.2 £2 billion. Pound. That's why the tolls are needed both on Blackwall and Silvertown to repay the debt. Can drivers take evasive action to avoid the new tolls? And where do you think the new pinch points are likely to be? You read my mind. This is something I raised with TFL yesterday when it started to reveal the details to me. And I said, well, you know, because of the cutoff times, uh, essentially that if you drive north after 10 a.m. or drive south after 7 p.m., it will cost you £1.50 rather than £4. So surely you're going to have lots of drivers going very slow, if you like, heading south down the A12 or going very slow heading up the A2 as they approach either side of the river. And of course, when you're on a two or three lane sort of inner city motorway, there ain't anywhere to stop and you cannot simply pull over or put the brakes on. That could be a recipe for disaster. So TfL will have to keep this under control. The only thing to say, though, is that actually a similar situation applies with the congestion charge zone and that it has a hours of operation of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that, for example, if you are crossing into the congestion charge zone in central London, either side of that, there is an incentive to delay your journey, either get there before 7 a.m. or wait until after 6 p.m. And uh, gradually, or essentially Londoners have got used to this and probably give themselves a bit of leeway and that there haven't been any sort of uh, nose to tail crashes on Park Lane as far as I'm aware as uh, Londoners look to avoid the higher charge. So fingers crossed this will happen also with these two tunnels and that uh, drivers will become quite quickly aware of when they have to depart in order to either make sure they get the cheaper rate or to avoid the more expensive rate. And what are TfL hoping the impact on rush hour congestion will be? Yes, TfL is reasonably confident that the Silvertown Tunnel will dramatically reduce the delays you see at the Blackwall Tunnel, especially drivers who are heading north, because the particular pinch point with the Blackwall Tunnel is between the big round of it up towards sort of Peckham, Shooters Hill Way, and that sort of two or three miles heading north towards the river. As you sort of come towards the Blackwall Tunnel and you can see North Greenwich on your right, many, many motorists on a daily basis end up stacking and crawling and it can be 20 or 30 minutes going, uh, you know, three or four miles an hour until you actually get into the tunnel. Now, what they're saying is that these delays of 20 minutes or more will be alleviated by the fact that the Silvertown Tunnel will be there as an alternative option. And TfL expects that about half of the Blackwall Tunnel traffic, which carries about 100,000 journeys a day, about half of those 100,000 journeys will go via Silvertown rather than Blackwall, and that the delays should largely be eradicated. There's much more on these stories in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. We're back on Thursday at 4pm.